Happy Sabbath again. We had asked the men today to wear either a fun tie, a funny tie, or a special tie. Clearly, I'm not wearing a funny tie today. Instead, I'm wearing a special tie. I got married in this tie. Yeah, say it loudly so she can hear. Okay, I'm kidding. So, <laughs> in a very real way, this led to me being a father. So, this is my Father's Day tie today. Get, you know, usually when you, they clap and you the preacher say, give it to God, give it to God, but uh, don't think that's what we can send up to God, but it's wonderful to see you this morning. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer that we may hear the word of the Lord today. Heavenly Father, what a beautiful responsibility that you have given to each and every father that is here today. The kids saying with all their hearts that their father is a hero. And I pray, Lord, that each man here would live up to that expectation. That they would be the hero that their child deserves. A pillar of strength, a place of hope, and the priest of the home who bestows upon that home love, grace, and beauty. We say this in your son's precious name, amen. Let me tell you the tale of two different fathers. And men who are here, whether you are a spiritual father to someone, a biological father, or a hope to be one day father, I leave it to you to decide which of these two fathers you would rather be. The first father was the most influential spiritual leader of his day. His job was to lead the nation in the ways of God. It was well known throughout the land that he not only spoke to God, but God also spoke to him. This man was so mature in his faith with God that he was able to teach a future prophet how to converse with the creator. And yet, even though he could teach a prophet how to relate to God, it seems that he failed to pass on the same saving relationship to his own two sons. The father of whom I speak is none other than the high priest of Israel, Eli. Eli's sons were also priests by name, not by action. It was well known in Israel that they would rob the people when they came to give their offerings to the Lord. They often threw parties of drunken debauchery, and they were known to carouse around with women who were not their wives. It was so bad, the nation of Israel begged Eli, rein in your children's behavior, because it's getting out of hand. Can you imagine picking up the phone and calling Biden about Hunter Biden? So you got to rein in your son. (laughs) That's what they're doing to the high priest Eli. Even God spoke to Eli and said, Eli, you got to rein in your children. And yet... For some unknown reason, Eli neglected to teach his children how to properly fear the Lord. And over time, his neglect got so severe that God had to give him the bad consequences of his neglect. And God told him his children were not saved. They would not be going to heaven. And his sin was so severe, his whole family will be wiped off the face of the earth. Eli died knowing his children would not be in heaven. That's a sad thought to die with on your mind. But there's another father, a second father. He's pretty different than the first one. He was not as influential. In fact, he was a second-rate citizen. He was a day-to-day worker and made himself a day-to-day wage. He was poor in money, but rich in spirit. When the Bible first describes him, the Bible says that he 
was a righteous man. In fact, he was so righteous that he was able to converse with angels on at least three different occasions. He listened to the angel who said, you need to get up and flee for you and your children are in danger. And he listened. He remained in another country until an angel came back and said, it's safe for you to return home. The father, of course, that I am describing is none other than the earthly father of Jesus, the one we would call Joseph the carpenter. Ellen White says that Joseph diligently taught all his children the ways of the Lord. He used the lessons of his carpenter shop to teach them about the character of God. It makes you wonder if that's where Jesus learned how to tell a good parable. Did he learn it from, 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 from sitting at the feet of Joseph? I don't know. But Joseph did teach Jesus in parables. That we do know. Joseph went to the yearly festivals every year, but he did not just lead his children through the motions, no. He taught his children what each festival meant in the story of his people's redemption. Joseph was so successful in rooting his children in the ways of the Lord the one son of his named James would grow to be the pastor of the most influential church of the time, the church in Jerusalem. He even would write an inspired book of the Bible, the epistle of James. And of course, his other son, to whom he was an earthly father, Jesus. He rooted Jesus so deeply in righteousness that Jesus never gave him a temptation Jesus never once sinned, and because of the ministry of Joseph, Jesus could go to the cross as a sinless lamb of God, die for you and me, and save us from our sins so that one day we would join him in heaven. Joseph died early. He did not see Jesus go to the cross, but he died with the great conviction that he would one day see his children in the glories of of heaven. And as we contrast these two fathers, we see something very important. A father is essential in bringing his children to salvation. Now the work doesn't fully lie on you. We would be mistaken to say that you're the only component, you're not. But we would also be mistaken to say that you don't play a role whatsoever. You play a vital role in bringing your children to God. And as we look between these two fathers, I have a simple question for you. Which of these fathers would you rather be? Would you rather be Eli, who neglected to pass his faith on to his children so miserably that his children can't go to heaven? Or do you want to be like Joseph, who succeeded in rooting your children in God so deeply that you know that when your eyes open at resurrection morning, you're going to see your children with you? Which father do you want to be? Do you want to be Eli? Or do you want to be Joseph? Joseph, right? He, he don't got kids yet. <laughs> and he knows the right answer. The answer is obvious, right? Every Christian father wants to see their children in heaven. Amen? Amen. But here's the catch. Every Christian father wants to see their children in heaven, but not every Christian father is doing the work necessary to help their children get there. Men, I want to talk to you honestly. I want to ask you, those fathers, to do an honest self-assessment. If you were to decide, which father are you today? Are you acting more like Eli? Living the silo of your faith, you love God, but you're not passing it on to your children? Or are you Joseph, who is deeply rooting your children in the ways of salvation? Be honest with yourself, who are you, Joseph or Eli? If you don't know the answer to that question, 
If you're brave enough, go ahead and ask your wife. (laughs) You might learn very quickly which one you are. Or hey, if you're really brave, ask your children which one they see you as. For those of you, hopefully they don't, you never see your, 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 your children will see you as God, right? I don't know why my kids answered that way. But, uh, the reality is that for those of you who are more like Joseph, I want to commend you because you men are a rare breed. To be honest, nowadays most men relegate their religious responsibilities over to the mother at best. Sometimes the children at worst. They allow the mother to be the priest of the home rather than taking up their sacred responsibility to be the priest for the generation that follows. But for those of you who know that you're like Joseph, I commend you for your faithfulness. Now, while the sermon may not be pointed at you directly, there are still things in here you can learn to solidify your children, your homes, your church in the faith. But for those of you who were honest and you circled that name Eli on your handout, I also want to commend you because it takes true strength to look inside yourself to see what is not right with God and admit that it needs to change. I commend you for that because that takes great strength. But I'm also a loving pastor, a gentle shepherd. And so in my love for you, for those men who lean toward being an Eli or know they are an Eli, as your shepherd, I call you to repentance today. If you feel that conviction moving on you, it's because God's talking to you. He's telling you that there's a better way that he wants you to lead out in your home. And if you heed the word of God today and you learn what the Lord requires of you, then you can step up as the priest of your home. You can pass your faith on to the next generation and your children can look at you as the priestly pillar of your house. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles, please, let us go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy what chapter? 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we will begin with verses 1 and 2. 1 and 2. As we pursue this passage today, we are going to learn the various things that God requires fathers to be doing inside their home. And the first thing we need to realize is that you men have a solemn responsibility. You are responsible for successfully passing your faith on to the next generation. Let's see what the Word of God says, verses 1 through 2. These are the commands, decrees, and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land you're about to enter and occupy. And you, and your children, and your grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. If you obey all his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Let's pause there. In the passage... Who needs to learn the fear of the Lord? You, your children, and their children. And who do you think is responsible for teaching them to fear the Lord? You fathers are. You men are. See, and God makes that clear through Moses just a few verses later. Let's go down verses 6 through 7. And you must commit yourself wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again and again to your children. See, he even got it too. The Bible, God is clear through Moses, men, fathers, 
You must teach repeatedly the ways of God to your children, your grandchildren, and all who follow after you. Fathers, you have a solemn responsibility to pass your faith on to the next generation. And the stakes are high, my friends. They are higher than most fathers realize. Never forget this. Christianity and Adventism are always only one generation away from extinction. All it takes is for one generation to fail to pass their faith on before our faith is eliminated. God trusts you to pass that faith on to others that follow. And if we fail in this, then the light of our remnant church will grow dim. It won't die. God will always have a remnant, okay? But our light will dim, and the passion and our fire will begin to smolder. But if you fathers are faithful, and you pass the faith on to the generations that follow, the three angels' message will continue going around the world, and we will prepare this globe for the soon return of Jesus Christ, our Savior. God trusts you, and I pray that you will be worthy of the trust that he has placed upon your shoulders. Are you an Eli, or do you want to be a Joseph. I pray that each of us, men who are here, will want to become a Joseph today. Now, as your shepherd, you know, I am calling those of you who are not stepping up yet to step up. I don't want you to step down from your responses. I want you to step up to what God is calling you. But I'm not going to sit there and call you to your ministry without helping you fulfill it. So now that you know you are the priest of your home, how do you pass your faith on to the children who come after you? That's what we're going to talk about for the next 10 to 15 minutes of our sermon. In order to pass your faith on to your children, the first thing you must do is this. You must teach your children the grace of God. Above everything else. You must seek after the salvation of your children. Here in Deuteronomy 6, 4, God says that we need to teach our children, saying, hear, O Israel. Remember, Israel was a family. It was a nation, but it was a family. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. What is the point that they're getting across here? You need to remember the context. In the first few verses, we read that they are on their way to the promised. They're on their way to the promised land. God has already delivered them from slavery. He has already saved his people, and they're all going to the land that the saved inherit. In other words, when they teach the children, that the Lord is their Lord, it's a specific Lord. The Lord who delivers his people. The Lord who saves his people. The Lord who brings his people to the promised land. Now we know from the Bible and Ellen White that all of these stories foreshadow our salvation. So in the exact same way when we teach our children about God, we teach them that God brought us from the slavery we had from Satan. He delivered us from the power of sin, and he's bringing us to the promised land of heaven. When we teach our children, we teach them the grace of God, and that means we teach our children the gospel. Now, I've met some parents who wrongly think that children are, are too young to understand the gospel. Quite frankly, I found every child just old enough to be able to understand the gospel. I've actually found some five-year-olds who it's easier to teach the gospel to than some 35-year-olds or some 55-year-olds. Because you see, when we get older, let's be honest, we get a little, I want to say stubborn, 
That sounds mean. Set in our ways. Let's go with that one, okay? We get set in our ways. We think we know everything. And then a new truth comes and, ah, oh, we know better. But kids, they'll, 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 they'll accept anything. The heart of a child knows the heart of grace. And Ellen White specifically says, you can see this in your handout, Christ came to teach the human family the way of salvation. He made the way so plain that even a little child can walk in it. Amen? That's the amen moment right there, brothers and sisters. They say the gospel is the greatest story ever told, but it's also the simplest story ever told. God wants everyone, whether they're two or 92, to be in heaven. And he made his gospel so easy that the moment your child begins to speak, Ellen Way says they already understand enough to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So explain to them the gospel. You know, there's a preacher, he's a Puritan, he's not an Adventist, but I do like his preaching, named Joel Beakey. I don't know if any of you ever heard of him. It's okay if you haven't. He tells a story about his, his, his parents doing like a 60th anniversary party. And all of the children were to write something to their mother and their father that meant something to them as a child. And all five children read the, uh, wrote the exact same thing to their father. And it was this. Whenever you told the gospel of God, tears always stained your face. Men, when you explain the gospel to your children, do you do it with the passion of a man who has been saved by God? Do you intensely tell them how Jesus saved you when you were a sinner? What that means to you? And do you let them see the peace, the love, and the joy that the gospel brings to you? Do you tell them that you were a sinner, that when God first made you, he loved you, he wanted a relationship with you, but then you sinned, and that broke the relationship you had with God. But even though sin broke your relationship with God, it could not break God's love for you. And so Jesus, who is God, came here to save you, to restore that relationship. And one day you will go with him to heaven and you will be with him in paradise. It is the greatest story ever told, but does it mean something to you, men? Does it move your heart? And do you let your children see what the gospel has done for you? I, I don't cry very often. And I don't let my children see me cry very often. But if I was shedding tears because of the beauty of the gospel, I'd want them to come see that. Why? Because then they know that God is real to me. And if God can be real to me, then God can be real to them. But we men, being the providers of the family, and I believe that, I believe men are to provide for the family the best they can. We men dedicate our lives to everything except getting the salvation of our children. We dedicate our lives to our careers, to our hobbies, to our friends, to everything else. And we just assume that when nighttime comes, mommy will pick up the devotional book. She will read it that night and have prayer and all will be good. Fathers, listen to me. Both Eli and Joseph wanted their children in heaven. But desiring your children to be in heaven is not enough. You need to also put the ministry in required to help your children get there. And that includes speaking to them about the gospel. You should speak with such intensity to them that they think their life is in danger. You know why? Because it is if they don't accept the gospel. Go to them, right? There's that, that song, plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently, forget gently. <laughs> There's a lot at stake. That hymn is wrong in that part. Don't plead gently, plead with fervency. So when you die and you raise from the dead, you know you will see your children in heaven. Men, ask yourself, which would you rather have for your child? 
would you rather them have a nice house here on earth or a mansion next door to yours in heaven? As for me, I'd be fine with them living in a trailer here as long as they got a house by Papa when we get to heaven because that's where I want to see my children. Ask yourself, are you working diligently to explain the beauty of the gospel to your children? Personally, I absolutely refuse. What was that word I just used? I refuse to go to bed until I pray for the salvation of my children. I am not going to lie. I'm going to be honest with you. Please don't judge me. I can be in the middle of praying for you (laughs) and start to get tired. Hey, has anyone else here ever been praying and falling asleep while you pray? Anyone? Okay, all right, good. I'm not the only one, right? And then you wonder, like, in your sleep, like, what gibberish did you just pray to God? Like, I knew I was in prayer one day, but I also went to a dream about a purple elephant, and woke up, and I was like, I don't know if that counts as prayer or what that was, but it was, I try not to do it. So I'll tell you this, if I'm praying, and I get sleepy, even if I'm praying for you, I stop. I do. And I pray for two little boys to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and as their Savior. And you know what? If you're laying in bed and you're praying for me one night and you start to get a little tired, you start to get a little sleepy, stop praying for me. It's okay, my prayers are enough for me. Jesus' prayers are enough for me. If you catch yourself getting sleepy, you stop. And you pray for the children who are over the next room or the children who moved out of your house and are now living away from the Lord. And you pray for their salvation as if their life depended on it. Because in the end... It does. Are you, as the priest of the home, teaching your children the gospel and the grace of God? Nothing in your life can take precedence over this. Teach them the grace of God, but also teach them the love of God. What good is it to be forgiven by God if we're not also able to come and have a relationship with God. Deuteronomy 6, 5. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Test your Bible knowledge. When we get to the New Testament, this is called the greatest what? The greatest command. Okay, you guys can do better than that. Okay, try this again. When we get to the New Testament, this is called the greatest commandment, right? Because it focuses you completely on God. And this, brothers and sisters, brothers today, is what we must teach our children. To love God as their best friend. Now this one, I'm going to be honest with you, it's, it's a little hard. You, you can't teach someone to love someone, can you? If that was true, there's a lot of lonely teenage boys out there, <laughs> you know, who be able to teach their, their, their high school crush to fall in love with them, right? You can't teach it. There's an old saying, there, there, there's some things better caught than taught, right? That includes your love for God. So you can teach your children the mechanics of relating to God, that's fine. But you must help them catch that love for God. How do you do that? Well, I can tell you how I do it. I let my boys see my love for God in action. You can ask my boys. I have a system for my door in my office. The system tells them when they can and cannot come into my office. And it's just like a traffic light, okay? If they see a green index card that means bulldoze on in you can bother daddy with anything you want sometimes though it's a yellow or orange because they pay more attention to orange it's the orange note card which is the yellow light and the blinking yellow light means caution slow down like no one answered that question 
You all know what blinking yellow light means <laughs> in traffic, right? <laughs> you know, it means slow down. It doesn't mean speed up. I think it means speed up, okay? If there's a yellow light, I, let's be honest. Who of you, when the yellow light hits, immediately judges, can I make it before it hits red? Be honest, right? Okay, see, I have a Hyundai, which has all these different modes as eco mode, standard mode, and my favorite, sport mode. And what I do every time that light hits yellow, I look down, boop! <laughs> all right, baby, <laughs> you know? That's what I do. I think that's what my children do when they see the orange light on my office door too, right? The orange light tells them, be cautious, Daddy prefers not to be bothered, okay? And then there's the red note, oh, the fearful red note. It barely goes up, but the red note means this. Unless mommy is having a heart attack or this house is on fire, don't you dare open that door, okay? Most of the time, my door is orange or red. Please don't come in. Don't you dare come in. But there is a time I turn it green. Do you know the times when I turn it green? When I'm praying, when I'm reading the Bible, or I'm studying the Bible. Why? Why would I let my kids come in at that time? Because if there's one thing I want them to see about their father is that their father is a devout man, that he loves God, that his relationship with God goes beyond doing what's right, goes beyond preaching, goes beyond serving the flock, and fully enters into an intimate relationship with not just my savior, but my absolute best friend. And you can ask them, even when I'm not here, if I sin against them, and I do, I will kneel down, I will ask their forgiveness, and then ask them to join me in prayer as I confess my sin to God. Why would I do that? Because as I confess my sin to God, they see that the gospel is real to me. They see the joy that comes into my heart, the peace that overwashes my soul. They see my love for God in action. We also, when we're driving here and I have them for Sabbath morning, we, we listen to rock and roll Jesus songs, which is just K-Love, by the way. But for them, it's like the rock and roll, right? I'm like, no, rock and roll is like Metallica and stuff like that. But for them, anything beyond a hymn, right, is, 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 is a vibrant song. And we sing, you know, soul on fire, right? That's how you change the world. You know, God's not dead. And I sing when they let me with all my heart. Why? Because I, I, I'm a terrible singer. You all know that. But I still, I sing at the top of my lungs when I'm in the car. Why? So I want them to see with their own eyes that their father loves praising God. I want them to see with their own eyes the beauty and the joy that it brings to my life that when I know that I praise God, I'm thanking him for all the blessings he's given me. I want of nothing that I need because my God is always blessing me. I want them to see my love for God in action. And when appropriate, that includes when we pray for you all. Keywords: when <laughs> appropriate, <laughs> we pray for you. Why? Because then as they see our love for the body of Christ, they understand that comes from a love that we have for the God that we serve. So men, I'm gonna ask you, are you bringing your children with you into your relationship with God? Or are you like Eli, a faithful silo, keeping everything to yourself, but ignoring all the children who are around you? There's a reason that mothers and fathers felt comfortable bringing their children to Jesus, to bless them, right? Because when they were in the arms of God, they felt the very love of God. And you men, if you want to pass your faith on to the next generation, live your love for God for your children to see, and they will catch that love, 
and they will follow God all the way to the grave. Live your love for them to see. The last thing as we close the sermon today, you not only teach them the grace of God, you not only teach them the love of God, you must, that was a big word there, you must teach them the word of God. See, it was beautiful, right, to hear your daughter say, what's her favorite memory of daddy? He reads us the Bible, right? That's wonderful. You can forget everything I tell you as long as you remember the Bible that I quote you. That's all you're ever gonna need, okay? It's a beautiful thing. Are you teaching your children the word of God? Bible is clear. Let's look at uh, Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9. And you must commit yourselves whole heartedly to these commands I'm giving you today. Let's pause there. Men, before you teach your children how to live, try to make sure that you yourself are living right. Okay? I mean, because let's be honest, right? You might hear a politician, not going to mention any names, because that might be a little too contentious today, but they'll tell you to do one thing, and then you find out behind the scenes they're embezzling money, or they're canceling votes, or they're finding votes. It's like, wait a second. You just told me to be a person of integrity, and look what you're doing, right? You don't want to listen to that person. You want to kick him out of office. Men, live like God first. Then you can call your children to live like God as well. Because by living like God, they see it's a reality. If it's a reality for you, it could be a reality for them. Let's finish verse 7. Repeat them, that's his commands. Repeat his commands again and again to your children, Talk about them when you are at home, when you are on the road, when you are going to bed, and when you are getting them up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Notice what he's saying in every single possible moment where you're breathing and you're alive. Teach your children the word of God. Driving in the car, teach them the word of God. You're playing with them on the playground, teach them the word of God. You're going to bed, you're going to kiss them on the forehead, tell them good night, teach them the word of God. Every opportunity you have, teach them the word of God. Now I know for some men, that's a hard thing to do. Maybe you think you don't know the word of God enough to teach them. Maybe you only know one chapter of the Bible, that's all you can teach them. Now I got a lot to say on this. I literally preached five sermons on this last year, <laughs> okay? So if you want to know more about it, go back and watch that. See, I have a lot to say on it, but not enough time to say it, okay? That's the curse of every preacher, by the way, right? We always get up here, and it's like, I got a lot more to say, but I can't say it. They don't want to hear my 49th point, <laughs> you know? So you got to leave it for another day. So I have a lot more to say, but let me give you enough tips to get you running. And this will be enough for you to be a priest of your home. First, when you go to teach your children the word of God, read them just one story, maybe a paragraph. Then follow this format. Okay, I'm gonna teach it to you how we teach uh, people who are going to school to be teachers. Follow this format, head, heart, hand. That means something in just a minute, don't worry. Okay, Let's try that again, just follow me. Head, you guys can do it, it's okay. Okay, try it together, right? Head, heart, hand. Very simple, when you're teaching your children the scriptures, explain to them first what they need to know. Why is this passage significant? Then talk with them about how the passage makes you feel, makes them feel. As you see Jesus rebuke the waves, and little Hadassah, how does that make you feel knowing God can do that? And then, hand, coach your children on how they ought to live in light of this word. It will take you five minutes. But if you do this one thing, you will be head and shoulders above most families out there. You'll be head and shoulders above most fathers out there. And you know what? Not only will it change them, it'll change you too because it'll expand your understanding. It'll feed your heart, and you will live in harmony with the principles you're teaching your children. Also, here's a few other quick tips. 
Have you ever studied the, your, their quarterly with your children? Every children here have their own program. Have you ever even looked at it? Have you ever an- helped them answer the questions? Help your children with their quarterly. Here's another one. When the sermon is over throughout the whole week, help your children apply that sermon to their lives. Now, this might be a hard one to start on. Hey, kids, how can I be a priest of the home, right? But talk with them about the sermon, right? Engage with them. Pastors put a lot of work into making the sermon happen. You'd be surprised at how long it takes to write a good sermon, okay? But if you build off of that with your children, then they will be able to follow with the preacher. Now, let me follow with the preacher. And let me tell you, it's powerful when the parents' ministry unites with the pastor's ministry, Let's partner together and get the salvation of your children. One last thing, if you're still too scared, I recommend this. There's an old book, and I emphasize the word old, called Bible Readings for the Home Circle. Anyone remember that book? Okay. I won't, I won't tell you where the generational split is here, but that was very, a bit marked it very clearly. It's a beautiful book, though, isn't it? I don't mean beautiful because the cover looks nice. The cover's probably torn by this point. But inside, through a question and the answer format, using Scripture, it will walk your children completely through Bible doctrine. I am telling you the truth. If you went through that book, and you commit it to memory, you would be smarter than most theology professors. I know. I use that book to debate my theology professors, <laughs> right? So go ahead, read it, teach it to your children, and by doing so, you'll teach yourself. Let me close with this story. I haven't talked to my father in six years, okay? But my father still has had a great impact on my life. When my mother and my father went through a brutal divorce, we, won't, we have talked a little bit about it, at the end, my father and I, I bounced between my father and my mother. My mom would move homes every three weeks, and my dad was living in a camper in the woods. And I would go there and live with him at times, too. We lived in the woods, this rinky-dinky camper, for over two years. No water, no bathroom, a crock pot, pretty much a slab of wood for a table, and two mats to sleep on. Literally, it was a roof over our head. Like, that's, that's as good as we got. But you know what? It was good enough, and I was happy to have that camper, okay? I was happy. But during that time, my father slipped into depression, and who wouldn't? right? Some of you here, like, yeah, I've been in a camper before. Like, you know what I'm talking about. Living in one can be very, very hard. Now, my father slipped in depression. Of course he did. You know, he's not providing for his family. His kids have to go to work. You know, at the age of 13 and 14 to be able to pay bills. You know, he felt like a failure, okay? So one day, I had just started going to Union Springs Academy where I became a Christian. I wasn't a Christian yet, but I thought it would be a nice thing to write my dad a card and tell my father how grateful I was for our two years in the camper. Okay? Now, I'm going to be honest. I don't remember everything that card said. I'm 30. Michael, how old am I? 36, okay. I'm 36. I was 14 when I wrote that card, okay? That was 22 years ago. I don't even remember I preached 22 minutes ago, okay? So I don't remember exactly what was in the card. But I do remember this. I said, Dad, thank you for those two years because I learned this from you. No matter how hard life may get, You never need to give up because you can always pick yourself up and carry on. Dad, thank you for being a hero to me. That was pretty nice, wasn't it? That's probably one of three times I saw my dad cry. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want to demean what I said. What I said then was beautiful. But how much more beautiful would it have been if I could look to my dad and thank him for my salvation. 
How much better would it be if I can look to him and tell him that he was my hero because he is the one who introduced me to God, to Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Men, you can be that hero for your family. And you know what? To be honest with you, there are wives here today begging you to be that hero for your family. There are children begging you to be that hero for your family. God is begging you to be that kind of hero for your family. Fathers and men, before you today stands a decision. You can be like Eli or you can be like Joseph. And God has placed a solemn responsibility on your shoulders. And if you choose the right way, to be a Joseph to your children, then you will be able to bring them to God and you will be the hero for them that God always intended you to be. Work for your children and minister to them because by your ministry, you may yet bring them to salvation.